together on some really fun experiments uh, and had a lot of fun in the lab and some late nights. And, and uh, uh, yeah, so Emmanuel uh, uh, started actually his uh, experimental career. First, he wanted to become a theorist, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but then uh, he started his experimental career actually at Stanford with Mark Kasovic uh, for a year or so of uh, a and then he went to the group of Tertensch, uh, um, where um, he built or finished this second DEC in Germany, I guess. And, uh, uh, and so after that, um, the work that we did together was on optical lattices, so we're was possible to make optical, uh, to load algebra atoms and optical lattices to compute on transitions. And then after that, uh, first had a position in Mainz, uh, and then back in Munich at Max Planck Institute, and worked pretty much on all aspects of algebra called atoms uh, 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 with optical lattices or without optical lattices, and with fermions and bosons and great many things to mention. Great um, many prizes, of course, for some of the <laughs> Kerber Prize and the Harvey Prize uh, and the Leibniz Medal. Um, yeah. Uh, um, well, um, um, we would like to welcome you very much, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Marcus, for the kind introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here again. It's always a pleasure. To be in Harvard, and uh, you know, of course, looking forward to much more interactions. Next year, we start our Harvard and the Q Center and things, so we will have a lot of interactions. Hopefully, also between the young people here and Munich, much more in the future. So, what I want to tell about today is three experiments we did recently on three different topics. Actually, two I announced in the talk, but I thought, well, it's an item colloquium too, so we should talk about a little bit of atomic physics too. So, we'll talk about some very recent results and research addressing, which are interesting also from anybody's perspective. So these are the three things I would like to discuss with you. First, start out with some recent experiments on the fermi hubbard model, um, telling you how we can see the anti-hypermagnetic order, and really kind of a profound manifestation, microscopic manifestation of the phenomena of spin charge separation at the microscopic level in these systems. Then I'll talk about something that's keeping us really quite busy over the past year or two, which is many body localization. Uh, and I'll just discuss recent experiments and also some new stuff on slow relaxation dynamics, trying to understand actually what happens close to this transition point, and what can we see, what can we say experimentally about this dynamics here. And finally, I'll talk about uh, Rydberg interactions. Again, this is interesting because we want to have tunable long-range interactions in cold atom systems for many reasons. I'll integrate that later, and I'll give you the latest status of where we stand on the Fermi order in one of Fermi Hubbard chains. And uh, so just, just a brief sketch of the phase diagram. I'll just go over these things very briefly because it's like reaching to the Pope showing you these slides here. And uh, just to give you kind of the basic uh, gist again of this Fermi Hubbard model, we have a more insulating phase uh, for larger interactions with temperatures. And if we go to even lower temperatures, we have this anti-chromagnetic phase in the system. And uh, the status a few years ago, 2015, was that we had seen these more insulating phases. Uh, we have seen short range correlations in different groups, in Tilman Esslinger's group and Randy Hewlett's group. But I think really last year was dramatic progress in kind of quantum <coughs> gas experiments all over the world. Uh, here in Harvard, in Marcus team, spectacular progress, Martin's group at MIT, our team in Munich, with bus to a significant stage, I think, where we can now say we see many things in the Fermi Hubbard model that we wanted to see, but of course, this is just a starting point. So I think now it's clear we can see also anti-chromagnetic correlations on short, medium, and Marcus also now on long range types, on long range scales, and that's that's a fantastic starting point for experiments. So what I want to focus on in my talk today is actually 1D physics and tell you that 1D is actually very special. And uh, has a very peculiar structure, and I want to show you uh, how we can unravel this structure with our detection method. So that's why I would like to go briefly into how we actually detect uh, these Hubbard chains. This is slightly different than how everybody else does it in the community. And so imagine you have, for example, this 1D chain where you have spin ups and downs of the two fermions in the system. You have empty sites and you have doubly occupied sites. And you would like to fully reconstruct what's on this ladder. So know everything of this occupation. How can you do that? Typically, when people image directly, 
Uh, it's not so easy to get spin resolution, or you could remove the green atoms and say the holes are my green atoms. Uh, that, that can be done. Uh, but then you also have the problem that you have holes around and doublons, and usually when we do imaging, they get also converted to holes. So we lose a lot of information. So how can we preserve this information? And one way to preserve this information is to take this chain and actually split it into two chains. So it's like making a big split operation, splitting this one lattice site that you have on this one chain in this direction, and splitting it into two sites. And when you do that under the action of a magnetic field gradient, you basically do a control Stangler separation. So the spin ups go to the upper chain, the upper chain, and the spin downs go to the lower chain. And now you do the imaging like we did before. And now we're having this information here and this information here. You can put together the full occupation of the of each individual chain, including the holes, including the double arms, including the spin, and the ups and downs. So we know everything basically about this configuration. As you'll see, this is crucial for the experiments that I will show you. So here's an example of how this looks like. This is the signal chain, for example, from another experiment. And uh, when you take the chain and split it into these two chains, you see we get, for example, whole holes, so empty, empty sites. And there's a spin down, a spin up, a spin down, a spin up, a spin down, a spin down, a spin up. And it's still up and it's been down on one other side. Okay, so that's how you can then put together this configuration of that other side. Okay. So this kind of led us then first studies that we did with this just to look at kind of the antiferromagnetic order in 1D. Again, I focus on the 1D results here. Remember, there's no long range order in 1D. Uh, we have kind of power law decay correlations and exponentially decay correlations at finite temperature. And this has kind of the best shots uh, we, we got in this system. So we get the next neighbor spin correlator. This is measuring the spin correlations on site I and I plus and E, actually. Sorry, this should be E here. That's some distance here in the 1D chain. And you see that the next neighbor correlator, we get about minus 35%. And it goes positive, negative, positive, and so forth, negative, as you'll see from later data. This is not so bad if you compare it, actually, to what you expect in the ground state of this system. Ground state, again, we said of this Heisenberg chain, has, for example, next neighbor correlations for the parameter regime. This was done of minus 0.56. So it's not so bad, actually. Yeah? We could do better, of course, if we could further, but uh, this is not so bad. Indeed. And once in a while, you see like these nice shots, like the one I'm shown here, which is, of course, a lucky shot, because even in the Heisenberg ground state, this is a rare configuration where you have this down, up, down, up, down, up, this classic on the other configuration that we often kind of associate with the Heisenberg state. But of course, we should be aware that that's just a, even in a t equals zero state, a very rare event that you actually get to see in the lab. All right, now let's move to the topic of spin charge separation. And let's dope this system with holes, OK? So let's take this chain and remove one hole. Let's take this antiferromagnetic chain. I'm just characterizing it as this near state. But keep in mind, it's, of course, the Heisenberg state. And let's remove one, one particle here. So there would be a hole here. So if you just remove a hole out of this antiferromagnetic background, then you would have um, ferromagnetic correlations across the hole. And this, um, basically, this, this hole can now propagate freely. It can move across the chain at no energy cost. It leaves behind what we call a spin-on excitation. And this hole is called a hole-on excitation, which can propagate freely through the system. OK, you can see you can just push this hole further and further through the, through the lattice without any energy penalty in the system. So one important message we learned, that this hole can actually move completely freely in this antiferromagnetic environment. So um, if we look a little bit closer, if we look at the microscopic origin of this spin charge separation, we actually find the low energy configuration, the lowest energy configuration around a hole is not a ferromagnetic configuration, but an antiferromagnetic correlation. So if you put a hole in here, you find this state has lower energy than the one where you would have ferromagnetic correlations across this hole. In fact, you can see the following. You can say that each time there is a hole, the sublattice parity, which I'm characterizing here by plus 1 or minus 1, just denoting how this antiferromagnetic order is placed on my lattice. So this would be you know, a plus 1. This would be a minus 1 order. There would be up, down, up, down, up, down. This would be plus 1, 2. Each time you cross a hole, it introduces a kink in this antiferromagnetic background, a flip in the sublattice parity. Okay? Each time there is a hole in the system. Let's try if we can see that. So here's where our, our microscope comes in handy. So now we can measure a correlation function, which already in solid state you cannot measure. Okay, this is now a three-point correlation function. We're asking, what is the spin correlator across site i and i plus 2 if there is a hole in between at site i plus 1? 
Okay? This is the result of the normal uh, two-point spin correlator that you've seen before. And now we may take the measurement of the correlator when there is one hole between at distance two. So we're distance two, but now there's one hole in between. And what we see from the measurement that we actually get a flip in the sign of the antiprobability <coughs> hole. Okay, so indeed what we had uh, uh, without the hole, there was like paramagnetic correlation at distance two. But uh, if you see here that um, if you introduce the hole, you get these antiferromagnetic correlations across the hole. Very clear sign that this hole indeed induces this sublattice parity flips. The statement is actually even more profound. It's not only just around, as we saw around this hole and the correlation that changed, but it's really the whole antiferromagnetic structure of around the hole is changed. So this is what is shown here. So again, it's a more complicated correlator, so let me kind of uh, try to walk you through that. So this is now measuring spin correlations at two sides. So we correlate the spin at side i and i plus d. If there is a hole at side i plus s, okay, and s can be smaller or larger than d. Okay, that means the hole is either to one side of these two spins, or it's in between, the hole is in between the two spins. Okay? So if s is smaller than d, uh, s is smaller than d, uh, then uh, basically the hole is in between those um, two <coughs> kind of spins that were correlated. And we see we get a certain type of antiferromagnetic correlation. So I took out the standard minus 1 d staggering factor. We get one type of kind of antiferromagnetic <coughs> correlation. But once you cross the hole, once kind of, for example, s is larger than e on this side, you see that the whole antiferromagnetic background on the other side is split the sign. Okay, so it's really not just a local thing around the hole. It's really the whole domains around that hole change their magnetic ordering. This actually works not only for a single hole. This is a profound statement. This works for as many holes as you have in the system. So let's now consider something like this, where you have a strongly doped Hubbard chain. Hubbard chain and you have many holes in there. And each time you have a hole, you get a flip of the sublattice <coughs> Okay. And now you can already see what, 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 what emerges, that if somehow you could remove those holes, you would actually see a perfectly antiferromagnetic order in this sublattice parity. Okay. So if you kind of could remove this hole, you actually find perfect Heisenberg antiferromagnetic correlations in something that we call squeeze space. Okay. It's an artificial lattice. It's not the real lattice. This is a real lattice. But if you could form a lattice where you remove the holes, you find that the correlations, the antiferromagnetic correlations that you get on that squeeze lattice are actually exactly the same correlations that you get for a normal spin chain. Okay, so you can basically pull out the holes uh, each time a hole is there in, in the response to this. This is actually a very profound statement. This is, I think, what lies at the heart for me. It was beautiful to learn this at the heart of spin charge separation. So the statement is that in a unicode infinity limit, and this was actually found in 82 by Wojnarowicz and later rediscovered by Ogata and Shiba in beta ansatz, classical beta ansatz uh, results of the field, that if you write down the many body wave function of your n electrons on a chain, this factorizes into a wave function of spinless fermions, and these are the positions of those fermions, irrespective of their spin, times a perfect antiferromagnetically ordered um, Heisenberg chain with lattice coordinates, and now this is the important thing, with lattice coordinates not given by the original coordinates, but given by the coordinates of this emerged kind of squeezed space uh, kind of lattice geometry of where your charges have been sitting. Okay. And of course, after you open the ground state, you don't know where the charges are sitting. Your ground state is in the position of having the charges anywhere in the system. Is there a question? Or? No? And, and that's actually really remarkable. That's a very remarkable statement, actually, that this holds. And this is a precise statement for for U and equal infinity. And of course, if you go a little bit away from that, uh, this 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 holds still. And you can actually measure this order in this squeeze space by actually removing the holes. And the way you remove these holes is through so-called string correlators. And this is a, again a very important concept in one-dimensional physics. Uh, it was, the papers I really enjoyed reading on this are from Jan Zahn's group uh, in the Netherlands, where each time you know you have a hole, this one, uh, this operator will basically make a minus one flip to the antiferromagnetic order. Okay, and therefore you can then remove all the holes, and then you see what you get for this kind of what he calls the logically order order parameter, this 
extreme order parameter is just the standard anti-formulaic Heisenberg result for an absolutely filled chain of unit term. Okay, and that's a really remarkable and beautiful statement. So let me just say a few things about these string correlators and how we usually define order <coughs> parameters in condensed matter physics for those of you who are not so familiar with that. So typically what we talk about order parameter in the Landau paradigm of phase transitions, we take a two-point correlator and we say that should go to a constant in constant value at large distances. So classical examples are um, magnetization, uh, DC order parameter, DC as superconductor. So if you tell me, for example, in the magnet, the magnetization at one point, I can tell you everywhere what the magnetization is. So local knowledge is sufficient to tell you everything about the order that is present in the system. The kind of order we're talking about here is a very special kind of non-local order, a hidden order. And that's why we need these kind of string correlators, where now you really find this correlator. It's a kind of a more special, subtle type of correlation that you can have in the many body system, which, uh, where you see, actually, you measure a two-point correlator at sites x and y, but you need to know stuff that's going on in between those sites x and y along a string that connects these sites x and y. And we talk about a string correlator assuming kind of constant value here to have kind of a hidden order parameter in the system, and in order to evaluate something like that, you know, people call it hidden because you couldn't, nobody ever thought you could ever measure these objects, right? Because in order to do that, you need to really take a snapshot, a photo of your whole many body system. And that's why people thought they cannot be measured, they're just theoretical constructs. But as I'll show you, and we've shown in earlier work, they can indeed, of course, be measured with the, with the quantum class microscopes. So one classical example is the, the so-called Haldane spin one chain. I'm just plotting here a variant of a slide that I have for a realization of that with long-range interacting bosons, but forget about that for a second. Just think of a spin one chain where you have zero spin plus one and minus one spins. And in this Haldane spin one chain, which is actually the, one of the famous results Haldane got the Nobel Prize for this year, you actually have precisely such a hidden antiferromagnetic order. So you have super, the ground state is a superposition of such states like the one here. And if you stare at it carefully, you see the order of what that is in there. Namely that whenever you have a spin down, a minus one spin, it's followed by a plus one spin, but you don't know when this plus one will come because there can be an arbitrary length of string of spin zeros in between. Okay. So, but if you pull out the zeros, you see you have perfect minus one plus one, minus one plus one, icing order, long range icing order in this string correlator, and this can be measured. Okay, so let me show you now our results, how to measure that in our system. So here's the two-point correlator uh, for different dopings. Okay, so now we have the close to unit filling, we see the result we had before, and now we increase the doping, and upon increased doping, you see basically the two-point correlator pretty much rapidly approaches zero, or at least doesn't show anything of uh, kind of uh, antiferromagnetic correlations, as you would say. And now we can apply our string correlator to that, pull out the holes, and lo and behold, we see this antiferromagnetic correlations come back. Okay. And it's really beautiful, they all come back almost to, if there's some rescaling that you have to do, but after this rescaling with the density that theory predicts, you pretty much get pretty much exactly the same correlations in the system. So you can really directly see this in any form of magnetic order in the system um, with these quantum gas microscopes. So that's very nice. And it's a direct kind of visualization of this very profound statement of the factorization of the wave function. Here's something, another plot that actually also surprised me. Uh, we have kind of worked together with Eugene and Fabian to understand all these things a little bit better. So I'm sorry if I don't have all the answers to all the results that I'm uh, presenting and the questions you might have. Here's kind of a spin, cor spin correlator, and now uh, uh, across distance these sides, and now we are putting different number of holes between those two spins. Okay, zero holes. That's just normal antiferromagnetic chain. We see we have up down, up down, up down. Okay, standard antiferromagnetic order in the one D chain. Now we start to put one hole in between. And we see like how this order kind of is shifted. This what was positive is now negative correlation, and the domain was shifted. You've seen that before. What is on the diagonal? I think what is quite remarkable on the diagonal actually, you see that the strength of the correlator that you get actually, you know, even over a distance of five sides with four holes in between, the antiferromagnetic correlations are almost as strong as uh, when you go kind of to distance two, for example. So these holes are like really something that you can completely remove from the system and uh, that really kind of don't affect the antiferromagnetic correlations uh, very much. And uh, that's, that's actually quite, quite remarkable. All right, and it all boils down. I remind you again to this beautiful result from Ogata and Shiba that you have this beautiful factorization at the microscopic level for spin charge separation. So that was something really nice. I, I learned a lot from reading, reading these papers. 
Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you about the hidden antiferromagnetic order that we can see in the system. And the next topic I would like to turn to is uh, on many body localization uh, and some recent results on that that we achieved. And before I do that, let me actually remind you of uh, some things how we actually measure that. Okay. So uh, when we talk about many body localization, we try to study interacting quantum systems in this order of potentials. And the system we specifically looked a lot is this kind of uh, we under type model with kind of interactions, interacting with the under model. So you have just hopping on fermions on the lattice, you have a quasi-random lattice potential, and you have interactions between the particles, and we continue these interactions uh, with the fresh buff resonance, okay? Which allows us to study different interactions and the evolution of the system. So to probe whether the system thermalizes or not, we can actually, let me skip the MS part, we can actually set up a non-equilibrium state, like this charge density wave, let it evolve as a function of time and see whether over very long evolution times there is a remnant of this initial order in the system. With the logic behind this, if it's a thermal state, if the system thermalizes, it should not remember where it came from. No thermal state can remember where it came from. Right? The thermal state has lost all information about its kind of all knowledge about its actual initial state configuration. So if there is kind of still information available about the initial state, then if the system is not thermalized. So the, the logic of the experiment is to kind of set up this non-equilibrium state, let it evolve, uh, and then after some time read out you know, whether there is still some charge density wave here in this even odd occupation of the different lattice sites present. So what do we know about this? Uh, if we look at this kind of, kind of phase, schematic phase diagram, we know some reference point precisely for no interactions. We know that we basically have the non-interacting movie Ande model, which shows Anderson localization at delta over j equals 2. We have the point for Anderson localization. Another actually beautiful point is for infinite interactions, if you have no double ones, you just have singly occupied sites, you can map the problem of the very strongly interacting two-component gas onto non-interacting single component gas, and you again recover then, of course, the over -under model. So that's a precise, exact mathematical statement as well. So this we know also if there are no doublons present initially, and then you can guess, well, you know, if you have interactions, you have more kind of interaction strength to localize them, so this goes up, and at some point then it has to come down again like this. Okay, this is how typical time traces come to look like, how we deduce uh, kind of thermalization or no thermalization, and I'll come back to subtleties in actually evaluating you know, where the transition actually happens. So this is what we call imbalance, so how much charge density rate is still at the present as a function of evolution time. If there's no disorder, the imbalance relaxes quickly and you get basically zero uh, imbalance, imbalance here indicating a thermal phase with no memory of the initial state, but kind of collage this order strength you see you kind of come into a phase where even for long evolution time, this kind of this imbalance persists and you basically are in a non-thermal state. I should mention actually the recent realization of locate time crystals in Maryland here and here in Harvard are also kind of similar examples for such a non-thermalizing kind of quantum evolution in these systems. So then we can try to reduce where does the transition happen. So we try to find points, you know, what is this steady state imbalance after a long time evolution, which is here in this color coded. So this is this imbalance after a long time evolution as a function of interaction times. And we can say, okay, when it's close to zero, then you basically are in a thermal phase, and when it starts to increase, you start to enter this kind of non-thermal phase. And uh, I will point to a difficulty actually in determining the precise transition point from, from the graph that you can see and maybe find a way how it can actually be described. So here's just to show you the subtlety I talked about before. When we look at this steady state imbalance as a function of interaction strength, uh, when we have no double ones in the system, or when we have double ones in the system. Remember, I told you when we have no doublons in the system, the system should map even for very strong interactions to the non-interacting point. It should give precisely the same result as non-interacting particles. And this is even what you see. This is non-interacting particles. If we go to very strong interactions, you see if you have no doublons, they give it precisely the same steady state result. Same is true for, for attractive interactions. However, when you go to large double-bond fraction, actually you see that this breaks down, this mapping is not true anymore. And of course, the logic behind this is, if you have now double-bonds present in the system, they become new kind of heavy quasi-particles with a lower kinetic energy given by J squared over U, kind of an exchange energy scale. And this energy scale, relative to the disorder, is of course much smaller. So you basically have no, basically they see the disorder much stronger than, than the single particle. So how can we do better in finding this critical point? You know, how can we understand this slow dynamics close to the critical point actually better? And this is work now with uh, Ewood Alphan and Fabian Ale's group um, uh, on, on trying to do a better job on this. So here's 
kind of the problem that, that you have. So imagine this is our disorder strength, and we imagine that the system has some many body localization transition. So above a certain critical disorder strength, there will be a transition here to finite imbalance, and below kind of uh, delta C imbalance should be zero. But of course, that can only be true for infinite evolution time. Okay? For any finite evolution time that I have to deal with in my experiment, I will run into the following problem that if my relaxation dynamics of this touch density wave becomes extremely slow, extremely slow, then of course I will observe a finite imbalance at finite observation time. So where is the transition point now? How can I conclude where the transition point is? Okay? And how can we in general understand this slow dynamics of the system? And one way to understand it is actually the following logic. I think Eugene and his group put out a very nice description of this. So to think of these systems, once you get close to this transition point, you have rare events where, for example, this order introduces over a certain kind of range of uh, size of a system a block of an insulating system into your, into your system. So let's say the system is thermalizing here, but here let's say that this order is a little bit larger, so here suddenly you've made a transition locally into the insulating phase, so suddenly you have a block across which the system does not thermalize very efficiently. The probability for such uh, blocks, to have such blocks of length L, scales exponentially uh, with the length of the block, and psi is correlation length of the uh, many-body localization transition. And then we can say, okay, at what time, how long will it take for such a block to thermalize with the surrounding environment? Well, that will just be exponentially long in the size of the system. Okay. Now, if we put that together with our kind of perceived knowledge of how this localization length should diverge at the transition point, we can actually find how we expect our imbalance to decay in our system, namely by just estimating how many rare regions, how many of these rare regions do I still have after a certain evolution time t in my system. So I just have to integrate you know, with the probability of finding a block of length L, where this is the block <coughs> length that has not thermalized yet at a given time t, and if you put all these results together, you find that you expect a power law decay of your imbalance in the system with a power law exponent that should go actually to zero as you approach the transition point. So this actually has been confirmed, this kind of suggestion has been confirmed in numerical results uh, on these prototypical XXE chains that people in the MBL field look at. So this is this exponent in this XXE chain going in D to zero, showing the power law decay of these imbalance curves. Showing these power law decays in the numerical. <laughs> All right. So showing these power law decays with the power law coefficient going to zero, pretty much at what we know the transition point is in this x x e chain. So it actually supports that this intuition is actually quite good and, and reasonable. And so we did this in our experiment. We looked at the balance very close to the transition point. And we look how the imbalance decays actually in our system, and we need also find decay curves that are at least consistent with power law decay. I think <coughs> to say much more than consistent is a bit tricky because our evolution times are really not long enough to say more than that. Because you know you're going down to very low imbalances, you're measuring relaxations to very low imbalances, and you have to keep track of these you know few percent imbalances, imbalances, which is kind of tricky from an experimental point of view. But if I just take these as power law fits and pick these power laws, and uh, look how that scales as a function of the critical disorder strain, I need find uh, this kind of dynamical exponent going to zero, indicating for sure a subdiffusive regime of anomalous transport, so the exponent is smaller than 0.5. Okay, so it's a very strange kind of regime of transport in the system, and indeed kind of approaching the zero value. Uh, and there's some background cutoff, which is just due to some finite coupling to the environment that we have in our system that we cannot avoid. So, but we need to see this critical slowing down dynamics, probably consistently caused by these rare blocks that form in the system, uh, that also is actually in reasonably good agreement with these exact dynamizations that come from Fabian Ali's group on precisely the system we're looking at in our, in our experiment. So that means if we take that as true, then we see that the critical transition point for our experiment is actually for, should be larger than delta over j round four. That's pretty much what we can say from the data. Whereas remember, the other tracking point is a delta equal to two the other All right, so let me just switch to the two-dimensional <coughs> problem of uh, two-dimensional two kind of 
many body localization, but what we can say about it in high dimensions. Everything people know from analytics and numerics is 1D, but really where things get much more interesting and where theory has very little to say right now is actually when we go to higher dimensions. And we do this with rubidium atoms, we use kind of projective disorder patterns and uh, with our micro mirror displays, so we can project arbitrary patterns like these ones here, all kind of just a disorder pattern onto our atoms. This is nice because it means you fully control the disorder configuration that you project onto the atoms. So you can actually uh, calculate what that should look like after your objective when you project it through your objective with your point spread function. But we can also do more. We can actually measure it side by side with a quantum gas microscope. We can measure the energy shifts of every lattice site spectroscopically. And this is what was done here. And then we can compare with what we expect it to be. And actually, lo and behold, it looks kind of similar. That's good, right? So this is, this is, this is you know, see this block here is this circle here. Then you have this line here is this line here. And this bulb here is this bulb here. So, but we take the experimentally measured values, so we really know precisely what this order we're projecting onto the atoms. And we can change this order configuration, of course, in, in a dynamic way. So the correlation length of this order is around 0.5 lattice sites. So it's short range disorder. We know the distribution function of what this disorder looks like, so we can use it for calculations. And that's work we did together with Vinny Kakamani and David Hughes and Princeton, who helped us understand uh, this problem of the 2D. System. So let's look what we can do and kind of what kind of experiment in the same spirit as before in the relaxation dynamics. What we can do now is we can start with more insulating states, uh, like shown here. We can chop away half of this one insulator by just cutting half of it away. And that's, of course, now a highly non equilibrium state that we prepare in the system. And then we can look how does the system evolve as a function of time if you have disorder or no disorder. If you have no disorder, you see the particles quickly spread out. This is over 250 tumbling times. And uh, they spread out in the trap. This is a single snapshot. If you average over many of those single snapshots, you see pretty much a spherically symmetric density distribution corresponding to a thermalized system in the gap in the, in, the, in, the, in the setup. However, if you kind of start to have kind of disorder in the system, if you increase the disorder here to delta over J13, for example, you see a very different behavior, namely that now, even after very long evolution times, over 250 tunneling times, you still see a kind of a remnant of this initial domain wall, meaning that this state is not thermalized. Okay. So that's qualitative. Let's do it a bit more quantitative. Let's again define something like an imbalance parameter, which is number of atoms to the right of the domain wall minus number of atoms to the left, divided by the total number of atoms. And then you can indeed see above a certain critical disorder strength, we see for larger disorder strength, we see the saturation to a constant value uh, that you can see here. And uh, we can plot this now. So this steady state imbalance after, let's say, 200 tumbling times as a function of disorder. And you can see now that this is pretty much zero kind of a balance up to a certain critical disorder strength. But only once you increase above a certain critical disorder strength, you see this increase giving evidence that indeed we've crossed the transition to the MDL phase. Interesting, you can look at the density profile. You can take this domain wall and measure the density profile after some long evolution times. And when you look at these density profiles, you find that they have exponentially decaying profiles. And you can extract a decay length from that. And this decay length is plotted here. So this is the decay length of the domain wall uh, as a function of this order string. And you can see that it actually seems to diverge precisely at this point where we see the onset of the imbalance. Okay. So it's the first time, I think, that one sees really a diverging length scale in this whole MDL game uh, in the experiment. Also, just to show you that interactions indeed do play a very, very important role in the game. Here's kind of simulations done by Vidika and David where you look at the non-interacting problem, precisely the disorder configuration that we have in our system. So we just take exactly the disorder distribution we have. And you see that for the non-interacting gas, even a very small, small amount of disorder gives you immediately a finite imbalance, which is what you expect. And as localization happens at epsilon disorder strength, you need arbitrary <coughs> disorder in 2D to localize the system. And this immediately gives you finite imbalance. Whereas the interacting system, as you can see here, looks extremely different. So this is the data I showed you before with this transition point around 5. If we lower the density of the system to make interactions less important, we see indeed that this shifts towards the non-interacting point. But still, you can see this is like dramatically different from what the non-interacting system does. So interactions really play a crucial role in how this transition is occurring in the system. So one thing we're, we're looking at right now is actually to combine 
kind of a mixture, for example, of systems, one which sees the disorder potential, one which does not see the disorder potential, mix them together and ask how do actually two systems that are in contact with each other, how do they behave when you have an interacting one and which sees this order and one which does not see the disorder? Yeah, will they localize? Will they destabilize each other? And uh, these are kind of fundamental questions to understand kind of what's happening at, at this MBL transition. Also, if you add in this disorder, remember since we're projecting it, we can project arbitrary Disorder patterns, we can project holes in the disorder where you have thermalizing blocks now included, and you can ask how does that influence kind of the stability of the MBL transition. So these are all important questions. Many of them are on our agenda. Many of them we've tried to answer already. But I think they are open questions. And I think the main message also I want to give you from this slow dynamics, we have to be very careful in saying something about the critical point because of this slow dynamics occurring close to the transition. All right. Uh, so actually, in here it was the way actually how we reduced the density here in this gas was that we actually took this initial state, which is one spin component, <coughs> we made a high over something pulse to flip few atoms into another spin state, and then we removed the other spin state. Okay, this gives you this picture. But if you do not remove the other spin state, then it's there, and it's such, our lattice configuration is such, our disorder configuration, that this spin component, this other spin component, does not see this order. Okay, so that's just how we chose the lattice potential disorder. So automatically you have two spin components in contact, one which sees this order, the other one which doesn't. You can change the ratio of them continuously in large number of you know, non-localized ones and, uh, and vice versa. And then you can start to see you know, what, what's going to happen when they evolve. So that's, I think, a very, very interesting experiment uh, to understand. And you have perfect overlap between them. All right. So finally, well, it's slightly correlated because of the finite, because the objective introduces uh, finite correlation length. This is what I showed you before. It's 0.7 lattice sites, the correlation length of the disorder. So that's as good as we can do right now. All right. So let me finally switch to a little bit of atomic physics. But again, it connects, I think, to everything I saw before. So let me let me most motivate by it. So, so in many cases in cold atoms, you know, we are, we're trying these days to engineer long-range attractive <coughs> quantum systems uh, because it really dramatically enriches what we can see. We have this beautiful droplet formation, for example, that we've seen in Tillman Fowles' experiments. We have the beautiful experiments here on potassium rubidium, for example, in the polar molecules. What I want to focus on today is Rydberg atoms. Why Rydberg atoms? Because Rydberg atoms, you can basically, any atom you can turn into a Rydberg atom. And that makes it important because now we can, for example, take these beautiful arrays of Misha or Vladan and Marcus or this uh, from uh, Antoine Gauvet in Paris, where you have this beautiful configuration of atoms. And now you, that's nice, but now really what you want to do is study interaction between these particles, right? And how you kind of implement interactions now in these systems. Well, you, as I show you, what you can do is you can actually tune to Rydberg states. Another way, which is actually interesting, which Ashwin, for example, put forward, is if you, uh, maybe you can have even kind of new kind of uh, Floquet symmetry protected phases if you have time-dependent Rydberg interactions, time-dependent long-range interactions that you can implement in these systems. So there are many aspects why this is interesting, so let me, let me show you what we have done and how this actually works, this Rydberg interesting. So here's the energy scale of two Rydberg atoms as a function of distance between the Rydberg atoms. Uh, both are in the ground state, where nothing happens. If both are in the Rydberg state, because they're so polarizable, there's this strong Rydberg blockade effect with uh, scales here, the van der Waals interaction, like the 11th power of the principal quantum number. And that's actually a huge energy shift. So for example, if you take two Rydberg atoms, remember in our lattice, we have lattice spaces of 500 nanometers. If you even bring them to one micrometer separation to even modestly high Rydberg state, you already have energy shifts of 500 megaatoms. So that's like gigantic energy scales for cold atom physics. Okay. And uh, so now, what we want to do is we don't want to work with these huge interactions. Because also they come at a price that basically whenever you excite resonantly to a Rydberg state, the lifetime of that Rydberg atom will be very short, or typically on the order of tens of microseconds. So why not do the following, trade a little bit of interaction strength for lifetime? Okay? And that's what we do, and that's the idea of having these stressed Rydberg atoms. So we have a single photon transition from the ground state to a Rydberg state, with a certain tuning delta. <coughs> And the idea of that is, of course, that now you mix a little bit of your Rydberg state to your ground state. So you 
make basically a deuterium atom, which is the original ground state atom, with a little bit of a mixture of your reverse state, and with the idea that the tuning is much larger than the rub. So what happens? Okay, you start with your bare states that we had before, you couple them. To first order or kind of second order in the energy term, you mean the coupling term, you get the AC Stark effect, of course. So you get a huge AC Stark shift. You get a huge Stark shift on the order of, let's say, 140 kilohertz for your, for your ground state atoms, which are these two atoms. And in addition to that, if you go to kind of fourth order in the coupling, then you actually find what we're looking for. There's this kind of interaction dependent, range dependent, distance dependent interaction shift which is the Rydberg address interaction. So it's a soft core interaction potential. It doesn't you know, go into infinity here. It's a soft core interaction potential. So what are these characteristics of this soft core interaction potential? Well, if you look at the height of the interaction potential, how strong is it? That's just a question of laser power. So how much Rabi frequency you have available. That's just omega to the fourth divided by the tuning cube. The range of the system, how long range is your interaction? Well, that's basically the term determined by this kind of Van der Waals radius in your system. So this determines the range, and typically this will depend then on the C6 coefficient of your Rydberg state and the tuning, typically in the range of 1.5 to 3 micrometer, depending on how high you excite your atoms. Okay? And now the lifetime, this is now where the good thing comes in. You see the interactions are now small, but still for cold atoms, that's huge. 2 kilohertz interactions over 2 to 3 micron, that's actually a very large interaction scale. But now what we've gained, of course, we've kind of gained that this effective lifetime of this Rydberg state has become now enhanced by the population, by the small population that we have in the Rydberg state. So what has been done on Rydberg dressing? Well, actually, when you look at the literature so far, it's been pretty disappointing. So, so far, the story looks so promising, but when you look at experiments, it's really rather frustrating. So you have, uh, from the Sandia lab experiments, which showed first results on Rydberg dressing between two atoms, but this wasn't really in the Rydberg dress. This was more resonant interaction. You see the dressing, the Rabi frequency, the detuning were almost as, uh, kind of large to, as, as large comparable to one to each other. So it's really more in a resonant regime, resonant dressing regime, if you want to call it like that. Then in 3D, there were actually two months out that didn't detect anything, any effect of this Rydberg dress interaction. And then, in, in actually, in frame quarters group, what they saw is just like line broadening effects and catastrophic losses. So that actually sounds like not good, right? So what can we do? What can we do better? And how can we understand what's going on in the system? Well, let's first try to understand what actually this interaction is going to do. What is your yes? So are these experiments are in a regime where you dress with a single Rydberg state or a many Rydberg states, so what, what's the delta? Which is just we're coupling, we're coupling to a single, a single state, and we can have tens of megahertz in tuning. So we are, we are, the experiments I'm going to show you just have a few percent of Rydberg mixture, so it's rather large in tuning. To a, to a single state, not? To a single state, okay. S to P, single photon transition. So we built a UV laser system for a million to make a single photon transition from S to P, to P Rydberg state. So now let's imagine what happens. You have your ground state atoms in rubidium, for example. These are the hyperfine states in rubidium atom. This is the one, for example, you initiate the Rydberg dressing to. So its energy level will be shifted, and there will be this Rydberg, Rydberg interaction if you have two atoms in these deuterium states. And so the model that you're getting basically is this quantum icing model, where this, for example, could be a microwave field coupling the two spins here at 6.8 gigahertz. Uh, and then you have this SZ, SZ interactions between the two G-tilde atoms. So two atoms are in the green state, they get this icing type interaction, where this BIJ is now the long range Rydberg press interaction potential that I showed you before. Okay. So this is the potential we have. How can we measure this potential? And the way to do that is actually Ramsey spectroscopy. We do Ramsey spectroscopy on this at a many body level. So we start with a spin polarized gas, everything in the epical one state with no Rydberg interactions. We bring the atoms into a um, pi over two poles into a superposition of the spin up and spin down states. Remember, the spin up states now feel the kind of Rydberg Rydberg interactions, and then, then we let the system evolve for a certain time, and we just close it with the final pi over two poles. Just standard Rydberg, probably some standard kind of um, Ramsey kind of interference experiment now at the many body level. And uh, this is kind of pictures that we see after this the single snapshots, for example, that we that we get where we measure kind of one spin component, we remove the other spin component, so we see, for example, where the spin-ups or the spin-downs are in the system after we did this Rydberg dressing for a certain amount of time. Okay. So now how can we, what, 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 how can we measure this now? So what we can do now, we can measure the spin-spin correlations, 
uh, at a certain distance in the system. And the idea is the following. You take a picture like this one, you make a copy of it, and you shift it by some distance, um, by some vector here indicated here. And then you basically correlate the two underlying spins with each other. So you measure the spin-spin correlation function, and you can show that these spin-spin correlation functions for short interaction times, for short phase shifts that are picked up due to this spin-spin interaction, that this is basically proportional to the interaction potential of the and this is what we measure. And here, so basically, direct measurements of the Rydberg Rydberg crest interaction potential coming directly out of the experiment. So, this is from the spin correlation experiments. You see, this is the dressing time, how long we kind of press the Rydberg atoms. And this is the interaction potential we see. And in this case, it's kind of a symmetric kind of interaction potential in two dimensions, but reasonably good agreement between theory and experiment. Okay. What's nice with the Rydberg dressing is you have full control over the directionality of the interaction potential. Think of the p-state, you have these p-lobes, right? These p-states, and either if your b-field is in plane or out of plane, uh, then basically you can have an isotropic interaction in the plane, or if you tilt the lobe into the plane, then you can have a highly anisotropic interaction in the plane. Okay, and this is what you can see here. So this is a measurement of the interaction potential uh, with the b-field out of plane, and when you tilt it in the plane, the lobe basically you see how now suddenly this becomes a very strong anisotropic interaction. We can also tune the range of this interaction potential. So here's kind of different ranges in the system, going for different Rydberg states in the system, where you can basically tune the range of this interaction potential over like something like three to four kind of uh, sites in the system. Now, what can we say about the coherence of this kind of time evolution, of this kind of Rydberg evolution in the system? So in order to check that, we really went down to prepare very controlled one-dimensional lines out of our insulator. So we now have one-dimensional spin chains, maybe 10 to 15 atoms. And we basically measure, first of all, the lifetime, which we now find actually to be a pretty good agreement with this kind of single particle limit that we expect to get. Yeah, so that's, that's good. So the lifetime is what we expect it to be, just based on the single single particle formula. And now in order to measure the coherent evolution of the system, what we'd like to see is uh, the spin ups and downs after we basically uh, turn on this kind of dressing interaction on this initial state. How do we detect the spin ups and downs? Uh, we don't have, like in this Fermi gas experiment I showed you before, we don't have this nice way of doing the stern gallon separation. But here we can do a different stern gallon experiment. We just take this one-dimensional line, pull the spin up atoms upwards, the spin down atoms downwards. And by that, you can just see, even reconstruct how the spins are distributed on the different data sites in your system. OK, this is now the first, first results we got just quite recently that we need to show you that we have coherent interactions over the small ranges in the system. So now, if you make this can, can Ramsey experiment, make a pi over 2 pulse, pi over 2 pulse with the Rydberg pressing interaction on, on this one dimensional spin chain, what now happens is you flip the spins into the plane, and you have this long range of Z and Z interaction, which starts to entangle the whole chain, where the particles on the chain with each other. But after a certain amount of time, there's a little bit of a revival occurring here. It's not even in theory. We don't expect it to be a perfect revival. And so maybe another one here of 2J, and then kind of seems to be some defacing that we have in the system. But we don't understand yet what is precisely going on in the system. But even seeing this first revival is nice, because it shows you that we need to have coherent evolution due to this root by interactions in the system. And actually, we can probably explain it's We don't know precisely why this is kind of reduced compared to theory. There are several reasons for that. We could have a little bit of random disorder in the initial state. So if you have a little bit of disorder in the initial state, you expect a subperfect revival. Or also, if you change the interaction shape of the interaction potential, it actually has a huge influence on how strong the revival is. So this is what we believe the root by interaction potential looks like. So it's actually quite nice box-shaped potential with a range of one lattice site, so next neighbor interactions, spin-spin interactions in the system that we initialize with this Rydberg dressing. Uh, if we do this, for example, with a different dressing state, which has, for example, these longer tails, it's not as nice cut off as we, as we had before, then we immediately would get weaker revival. So that, that just shows you that the shape of this actually interaction potential has a huge influence on the quality of the revival. All right, that's where we stand right now. Um, I think it's good progress towards really realizing coherent, long-range, switchable interactions in ultra cold quantum gases. I think it's confident, I think confident that it can be, this can be improved. And this is kind of good news, of course, for all these kind of design analysis experiments where you precisely want to make use of such kind of coherent interactions in the system. 
And of course, we want to do this also, you know, for 1D larger 1D systems, 2D systems eventually, and understand how these reflect interactions work in these larger systems. All right, with that, I think I've told you everything I wanted to tell you, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.
But the fact is that it doesn't matter. So in the, the, the mathematical statement is all this does not matter. Every time you have the hole, you can just pull it out, basically, for the correlation. It's a very remarkable statement, actually. So just to follow up, in this picture, is this post-selecting on only cases where you have two intact chains and nothing you know, else going on on the sides and then separated by this many holes? Uh, what do you mean two intact chains? Or does this chain? also include situations where there's like off on the side like some other number of holes and then... Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Show this one with really evidence for weakness dynamics in 1D, what we call 2D, or 2D, T to the power of all of yeah, we have, I can show you the results on that. We have results on that. If t to the minus log t fits better, then the simple power law. So the chi square is lower in the fit for that. But I think when Michael and Salan calculated the expected critical exponent for that, that doesn't match well with our experiment. So we, I can show you the data. We have the data in 2D for that. Um, so for the rhythmic dressing experiments, the 4.6 millisecond lifetime, is so does that mean for like a two kilohertz interaction that you should have limited to about eight particle chains, or could you do you imagine in the future with more power and the Yeah, it's just a question of power. So it's just a question of laser power. It's just that we if we if you focus your beams a bit more, you know, and uh, have more power available, then at this game, everything in this river game is just a matter of power. What's the game size and power right now? So right now it's around fifty micron and the power is around thirty milliwatt. In the UV. Yeah. In the UV. So this, this does not go to the black so right? it's from the side. This goes from the side, yeah. This goes from the side. So it really, uh, as far as we can see, if you want to do it, uh, what I can recommend, do the most powerful laser you can, and then tune as far as you can. And mm -hmm. it's the best. Uh, then you avoid also a lot of nasty short range physics we talked about before that I didn't mention here. Yeah. 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 Is it serious to think about the two component request? Uh, with dressing the two components, <coughs> for sure. Of course, I mean, you can have more interesting kind of spin interaction in the system. Not only at ZSZ, you can have flip flop lots of terms, and X, X, X is Y terms in there, and you get more interesting kind of long range spin halotonians. But we start, we start. No, no, I know, I would like. <laughs> we start. We <laughs> want to offend. No, no, it's okay. Do you find two more questions? So, in your ideal experiments, the charges are less, but the spins are still coming. Yeah, that's a subtle question, actually, in the Hubbard model. So, in this Fermi Hubbard model, um, the spin sector, it's so what Ashwin is talking about, the spin sector, <coughs> because we have this order which is the same for the two spin components, the spins can actually delocalize uh, through the chain. <laughs> and what that means for the coupling to the charge sector is under debate, I would say. So maybe that kills eventually in the very long run MBL in the system, but it's not completely not completely clear. You don't see it in time scale. Not on a time scale. So so that's the thing I mean we want to make clear from to the theoretician. You know, of course in the experiment we always have couplings to something. Okay, the ideal MBL scenario never exists in any experiment that you have a totally isolated system. So we always have to have, we have couplings to the background, with photon scattering and things like that. Of course, we need to understand them, and we took a great deal of care to understand what our background decay rates are. And what I can say right now is that the background decay rates right now are more important, and they kick in around 1,000 something times, a few thousand something times. They are more important than this spin channel. That's, that's what we can say right now. But it's a, a subtle point, actually, in this, in this special model we're looking at. <laughs> Here's a question. So in looking at these this string order, do you, I, I can imagine when you prepare these one hand chains, for a given one D chain, there's some finite chance of not having, of having for some finite spin polarization, you might like, prepare a chain that has more ups and downs or something to find a Do you post select for chains? That no, we don't post select at all here, but there's a correction. You are right that one has to be careful, very careful about that. <coughs> And uh, that's probably a small correction to apply to the data, looking at the, what magnetization, what the distribution of magnetization in each chain is. But we're not both selecting here on any, I mean, that would be dangerous. Yeah. Because, for example, if you would take just two spins, right, and you post select on zero magnetization, then you always have antiferromagnetic order. Perfect. I mean, that's clear, right? Yeah. 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 string correlate. Yeah, okay. I think if you have more questions, I would invite you to come down here and. <coughs>